medieval peasantry in England had no hero, so they invented one. And the hero they invented was Robin Hood. He's in a way, uh, rather like the, the, the classic Western hero in, in Western films, he's a sort of redeemer. I think that one of Robin Hood's enduring appeals is that he is basically a lovable rogue. I think I've got as near to finding the Ridge Robin Hood as is likely ever to be po practically possible. From this night on, I use every means in my power to fight you. Robin Hood is one of the oldest characters in English literature. His story is as well known today as it was when it was first mentioned in a poem close to 700 years ago. First of all, they're just rattling good stories, aren't they? No one can the stories without being drawn into them. They are deeds of daring do. And that's what we all, all like, well, certainly I do. But also I think there is, from the word go, the feeling of uh, the small man against authority. That's why he could become a hero, although in a way he was a villain. Tales of Robin Hood have changed a great deal over the centuries. Some of the basic elements of the story have remained the same. Robin is a good man who's been outlawed through no fault of his own. He's forced to flee to Sherwood Forest, where he gathers about him a hardy group of fellow outlaws called the Merry Men. There is romance in the person of Maid Marian. And of course, there are his enemies the villainous Sheriff of Nottingham, and that least popular of English medieval monarchs, King John. Robin Hood is very much the main character. He's always the main character. He kind of gives the whole thing shape. But he really takes on being what he is by the characters who are around him. If a person today was to write a screenplay about a person like that, he would surround him with characters he could identify with because you can then introduce other themes. One of the characters can be used to be a joker. There's also going to be a love interest somewhere, something for the ladies. So you have a leading man, a leading lady, and underneath it all, a whole host of supporting characters. That will, that's what really makes a good story. It may be a good story, but there's also a strong historical context to the tales of Robin Hood. The Middle Ages in Europe was a harsh time to be alive, and the Robin Hood stories had as their audience a group of people who were barely surviving. This was the late Middle Ages, a period of time that spanned 500 years, from the 11th through the 15th centuries. It was a time when the glories of the Roman Empire were long forgotten, and Europe had become a fragmented agrarian society. A few nobles on the top, and a mass of illiterate peasantry struggling at the bottom. By all accounts, medieval life for almost anyone was bleak, uncertain, and often dangerous. Peasants were heavily taxed and totally dominated by their feudal lords. The lords owned the land and, for all intents and purposes, the people working on it. The peasants had to give up much of what they harvested to the lords and were barely able to grow enough food for themselves to survive. If they escaped the larger predators, they might easily fall victim to the invisible ones, germs. Medieval doctors knew little about the workings of the body. A good bloodletting was the most common cure. And barbers did a brisk business as surgeons, leaving their patients weakened and less able to withstand disease. Life for the ordinary people in those days was without doubt very, very rough. 
they would live in very, very poor conditions. If you managed to get to 35, you were quite old. If you got to 40, you were venerable. 90% of the population are peasants. A very high proportion of the peasants live on the edge of subsistence. Um, a lot of work's been done on this by 13th century historians. There's a great deal of debate about it. Um, it's been worked out that for a peasant family to subsist, you, uh, simply on their land, you would need about 10 acres of land. And one of the most chilling statistics is that 40% of the peasant population, perhaps more, seem to have had less than 10 acres of land. They seem to have had less land than they needed to actually live on. The peasants who couldn't survive on the land they had were left without any means at all. It was not unusual to die of starvation, unhelped by family, village, the aristocracy, or the church. There were so many people wandering around the countryside um, searching for food and dying. The government itself had to relax all the official rules on the identification of bodies. So many bodies, no one knew who they were, because people had forced out of the village communities searching for food. So you really got to get rid of any idea of Merry England in this period. For a large section of the peasantry, there was no Merry England. England, in the years when Robin Hood's stories were first told, was basically an occupied country, ruled by a French-speaking Norman aristocracy, which imposed severe laws. The bad guys in this were the Normans, the ones who'd come over with William the Conqueror in 1066 and beaten the last Saxon king, King Harold II, at the Battle of Hastings. It was said that the Norman laws that were brought across were terribly oppressive and they had crushed the Saxon people who were supposed to be happy and free in those days. One of the cruelest laws was the Forest Law, which reserved large tracts of land for the king and forced many peasants into poaching just to survive. The forest um, bulks large in the legend of Robin Hood, as it does in lots of other stories of outlaws in, in the 13th century, the Greenwood. One can understand why, because its extent was so great. I mean, the royal forest at the beginning of the 13th century actually covered about a third of the country. The people who lived on the land, being subject to this law, were not allowed to hunt the king's game, be it deer, be it wild boar, um, be it rabbit, be it hare. These are the things that were only for the king alone to hunt. When the forest would go out, well, foresters would go out, and if they caught anyone poaching on the land, it said that if they were in a particularly good mood, all they might do is chop off the fingers of their right hand, and they could no longer draw a bow. But they could most certainly be imprisoned, they could be hung or even blinded. People couldn't obey these laws and survive. Many continued poaching and were cast into a desperate life outside the law. It was almost impossible to capture criminals. The very great majority of criminals were never brought to justice. They were identified, they were accused, but what have they done? Like Robin Hood, they've become fugitives, they've fled. And the only punishment then imposed on these people was outlawry. And that was a complicated process in which you were summoned to appear at a certain number of courts. If you didn't appear at the end of them, you were then formally outlawed. Outlawry basically meant that the person was placed outside the law. They lost all their goods and chattels, and if they were captured in future, they could be executed. So that the notion of being outlawed is not, in fact, um, as we would think of it becoming one of the 10 most wanted or whatever and having vast arrays of organized police on your trail, the fact is that you simply are no longer guaranteed the protection of the law and anyone can kill you. Being an outlaw in the medieval world was a very real thing. There are plenty of laws relating to outlawry. And you could lose your rights, completely lose your rights as a citizen. It's a concept that we don't really have in the modern world because we have such a strong international law, but they didn't. And of course, if you lost your rights as a citizen, you kind of had nothing, you had no identity. This forest is wide. Can shelter and clothe and feed a band of good determined men, good swordsmen, good archers, good fighters. Are you with me? Popular portrayals of medieval life in Europe make it seem glamorous and entertaining.
frivolous films, Robin Hood cuts a romantic figure, the central character in a spectacle of good triumphing over evil. With the clash of sword against sword, his name and fame swept across a nation. Robin Hood, the outlaw, whose legendary adventures still live today. But his life as an outlaw is full of cheery comrades and plenty of food. But that's not how it was in the 13th century Sherwood Forest. In Robin Hood stories, it's an idyllic place. The sun is always shining, it's never raining, the birds are always singing, and there's none of these horrible little things like a hole in your shoe or a torn pair of trousers to be seen anywhere. It's an idyllic beauty spot in which to enjoy all the spice of life. In reality, it would have been quite different. The ballads describe life in the forest normally during the autumn and summer and springtime. Life in the forest in the winter would be very, very rough indeed. There's no doubt that people in those days would certainly have been very dirty. Bathing was not a thing that would have been done very much. It wouldn't have been approved of. Most people would have suffered from ni lice, nits, fleas. They would most certainly have suffered from worms, from eating very bad and poor food. In the Robin Hood tales, Robin and the Merry Men are perennially at war with the infamous Sheriff of Nottingham. Although the Sheriff's always been portrayed as an arch-villain, what would he really have been like? The Sheriff is the King's representative in each county. He's the person they're going to see on a regular basis. He's the person who's going to tell them what to do and what not to do. So he's the one who most people visualise as the bad guy. They know his face, they know where he lives in Nottingham, for instance, they've maybe seen him passing through the marketplace. Everything that's bad would be attributed to the Sheriff of Nottingham. I think the Sheriff of Nottingham has received a rather poor press. In a way, I feel rather sorry for him. All he would have been would have been a local bureaucrat who would basically have been getting it from both directions. If the, the peasants were unhappy, there would be discord. That would cause problems for the running of the area which he governed. And also, if he upset the king, if he wasn't getting sufficient taxes together, he'd get it from him as well. Um, I think the sheriff would not have been the one who would have come into Sherwood Forest hunting down Robin Hood, because his job would have been more important than that. He would have sent men at arms, he would have sent his soldiers in. So I really do think the sheriff over the years has become the, the archetypal baddie who's got a reputation which he really doesn't deserve. The sheriff works for King John. Excommunicated by the Pope, accused of murdering his nephew to get the throne, John's life was characterized by treachery, cruelty, murder, adultery, and incest. Behind the Sheriff of Nottingham stands one of the most gruesome kings in English history, King John, because the Sheriff is John's Sheriff, and the two of them together really are tyrannising England. Really, King John is the archetypal evil English medieval king. Even his close friend William the Marshal, one of his leading barons who actually remained loyal to John, described him as a felon. John is impious, he's licentious, he's lecherous, he's cruel. John is a thoroughly unpleasant, nasty piece of work. Robin Hood's enemy, King John, is in fact so roundly disliked by his contemporaries that his barons force him to sign, in 1215, the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, which is the beginning of the end of arbitrary royal rule in Great Britain. Between 1199 and about 1212, his reign of King John, the revenues of the crown probably triple in size. And that's the background to Magna Carta in 1215, this huge financial pressure of royal government. It's no accident, I think, that the name Robin Hood first appears in 1225, which is the same year as the definitive Magna Carta. And why is there that Magna Carta? It's more than anything else to restrict the money-getting operations of royal government. The Magna Carta, the Great Charter, is a series of non-negotiable demands that the barons put together in 1215 um, and got King John to agree to. 
Um, what they represent is a kind of skeletal constitution, almost, one might say. Um, and they've long been associated with some notion of a kind of bill of rights, that is a series of civil guarantees in law. The content of the document is irrelevant for modern democracy in its specifics. But the fact of the document, the first time that a king signed away power, said that his power was limited, is crucially important for the founding of modern democracy because it meant that unlimited power of royalty could be curtailed. So we look back on it, all democracies look back on Magna Carta as the foundation of their democracy. With real villains like King John, a disastrous, futile, and expensive war with the French. With the rampant starvation and thousands of people pushed into outlawry, people needed a hero. They needed Robin Hood. In the legend, Robin lives with his band of merry men in Sherwood Forest. And if life in the rough was difficult for the outlaws, it could be even tougher for those who were their prey. In the centuries before the invention of paper money or the common use of credit, transporting currency was a difficult and a risky business. And Sherwood Forest was literally a den of thieves. The Great North Road was the, the main byway um, from north to south of the country and it passed through Sherwood Forest. It was the area that all the traffic went on, um, merchandise, spices, um, cloth, all sorts of things were carried along that road and of course the King's Gold. There were a lot of abbeys and churches and things in those days and they were very, very wealthy and they used to transport money and wine and food from one to another. You set upon a journey in early medieval England as though you were going out to a battle. You'd take bodyguards with you, you would arm yourself. The road where it passed through a forest would be cleared for a bow shot on either side to prevent criminals armed with bows from simply leaping out on you when you were passing this road and robbing you. Um, you could see both sides of the road, so you could see there weren't lurking outlaws behind a tree maybe 25 feet away with an arrow already knocked, ready to jump out and ask you for your money or your life. Robin Hood is of course an outlaw, but he is no simple thief. Like many others who modeled their lives after him, men like Jesse James, Billy the Kid, or Ned Kelly, Robin Hood is both an outlaw and a hero. He gives the authorities a run for their money, but he's also on the side of the common people. In the early times, Robin was certainly described as being something of a brigand. He was not always particularly popular. As the years went by, he became described or portrayed as a good man who had been forced by a bad system to take on a life that he wouldn't otherwise have wanted and that he bought, one could almost say, a sort of nobility to the outlaw life, that he protected the ordinary people against the authorities that were around at the time, robbing the rich to give to the poor. This is a thing that was said to have done. I certainly think he would have done because an important thing, of course, for a good outlaw leader, a good guerrilla leader, is to get the local population onto your side. Well, Robin Hood's essentially the good outlaw. He breaks the law, he resists the law, but in the service of a higher and better law. And that's the core of his popularity in the Middle Ages, and I think still. I think what Robin Hood represents as an outlaw is the potential for a strong individual either to take the law into his own hands um, or to seek justice outside the law. And that notion that some strong individual can do what the system won't do is what makes him appealing, it seems to me, across time. There is this psychological 
um, identification with a hero who opposes authority because it is a very human thing to feel that we are somehow victimized by authority. It's very, very easy to feel that we are the underdog. And so here we have an underdog hero. One of the most unusual aspects of the Robin Hood story is that a rough medieval character has stayed popular for so long. From his first reference in a 14th century poem, Robin has never gone completely out of fashion. Shakespeare mentions him three times. So does the English poet, William Wordsworth. He is a character in Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe, and these days, he's the subject of thousands of pages on the internet. But it all started before most people could read or write. For many centuries, as the hero of more than 30 ballads, the stories of Robin Hood were sung rather than read. Some they talk of bold Robin Hood, derry, derry down, and some of the baron so bold. But I'll tell you how they served a bishop when they robbed him of his gold. Derry down, hey, derry, derry down. The ballads, I think, express a sort of a deep uh, longing for things to be, to be better. One could imagine the audience hanging on the words of the skilled singer suddenly come into this um, perhaps rustic alehouse. There he is in the half light, perhaps a few guttering wicks giving light the light of the fire, um, the face, the intent faces round in the half-light. Um, I can imagine it. The ballads were a sort of television of the day, uh, in that at the end of our day's work, we expect to sit down and, and be entertained by the, the, the uh, little screen. Um, and in, in their day, such leisure as they had, they too wanted entertainment at very little cost. And someone singing a, a ballad provided precisely that, that kind of entertainment. When Robin Hood was 20 years old, he happened to meet little John, a young brisk blade right fit for the trade, for he was a lusty young one. Ballads are not short, they're not songs, they're two or three hundred lines long, the early ones. In fact, very curiously and fascinatingly, they turn into episodes of television very well. You know, it's just about 28 minutes, a couple of big scenes and some interlinking scenes. Robin of Locksley, a knight bold and good, back from the holy wars becomes Robin Hood. Some of those uh, television series, you can see the writers have adapted these very successfully. So, you know, if you're sitting down in an inn or a hall wanting to hear a good story with a, perhaps a bit of musical introduction and accompaniment, this is uh, 30 minutes. And there are people I've heard who are still doing this and they're quite compelling. Bold Robin Hood said to his jolly men, pray tarry you here in this grove and see you all observe when we go right through the forest. But a story can't stay popular for hundreds of years without keeping pace with changes in society. And there have been plenty of changes in Robin Hood's character and story setting. By the 18th century, Robin Hood's stories were not only in print, they were bestsellers. Robin Hood's uh, broadsides, as they were usually called, uh, usually sold for something like a penny, uh, produced in enormous quantities for a sort of uh, commercial cash market, hawked around uh, from village to village and town to town all over England. As the centuries passed, Robin Hood's character needed to change with the times. By the Elizabethan age, a rough medieval outlaw who beheaded his enemies was too nasty for popular taste. One suddenly has books of Robin Hood. He's no longer just a folk hero. He's a hero in a book. And he becomes an aristocratic hero. Anthony Monday in the late 16th century is commissioned to actually write some plays. These 16th century plays 
create a Robin Hood who has a pedigree. Um, and by, by giving him a pedigree, they change him from somebody who is the ordinary yeoman to somebody who is actually representing a kind of noblesse oblige. And it's because fashion is changing, the economy is changing, and Robin Hood begins to be a figure popular with the middle classes. And of course the middle classes didn't want a forest figure, they lived in cities. They wanted a figure they could identify with. They still wanted him to be an outlaw, they still wanted him to be a revolutionary, but they wanted him to express their values as well. Henry VIII dressed up as Robin Hood with his courtiers and came charging into the Queen's bedchamber one morning for reasons we don't know. All the, te all the text says is they were dancings and merry pastimes and leaves it to our imagination what happens. Robin Hood adds greatly to his respectability by acquiring one of the trappings of any well-born gentleman. He gets a consort, Maid Marian. In the earlier ballads, there's no real romantic interest for him, and I just think that they, they thought that he should have some sort of a wife or girlfriend, which um, would make the whole thing a lot more popular and appeal to a lot more people. Maid Marian started out as uh, a demure girl. She then went through a kind of whore, prostitute aspect, before she then converted back into the chaste, demure young lady that we know today. She found her feet eventually. When Marion comes into the story, there's not really much for her to do. Um, there are no sort of outlaw achievements that are associated with her, so she just tends to sort of stand around saying, oh dear, when are we going to get our lands back? But Several writers thought of things for her to do, and um, a number of 17th century writers think of lady, woman, beautiful woman in the forest, and they think of Diana the Huntress. And what Marion becomes as part of the band is a hunter and a killer, and she can use the bow, she does the hunting, and she becomes quite a strong figure, though not in a sort of partnering way. It's, it's curious as if she's parallel to Robin. It's intriguing that for previous generations, Maid Marian was defined by her maidenness. She was defined by the fact that she didn't have sex. That was about it. That's all we knew about her. Nowadays, of course, that, that doesn't fit in with today's mythology. So she's become feisty. She swings from tree to tree. She's probably having it off with Robin, and she certainly gives as good as uh, she gets. And of course, Maid Marian becomes the figure who stabilizes Robin Hood. When he marries Maid Marian at the end, he strives for her all throughout these adventures. But once he marries her, then he settles down to become a good, productive citizen. He is so irredeemably bourgeois. He is, uh, he is the Lord, but he's the nice Lord. He's the, uh, he's the ecological Lord. He's the Lord that everybody loves. Oh, yo ho ho, it is Robin. Who was that masked stranger who just saved our town? It was Robin Hood. Uh, he has his cake and eat it. I hate him. Stay <laughs> there, Master Robin. Now will you? Ah, go quickly, Master Robin. They're going to kill you there. In the middle of the 20th century, the Robin Hood legend attracted even more fans as it crossed into a brand new medium, television. series catapulted Robin Hood into the newest medium and into the hearts of a new generation. The series was broadcast throughout the English-speaking world and translated into a dozen languages. It was an instant hit for ITN, the second British television network, and even the theme song became a success of its own on the hit parade. Men, feared by the 
the bad, loved by the good Robin Hood. The series emphasized the adventurous life and male bonding. It also had a good dose of social themes, notably taking from the rich to give to the poor. It's written here that you paid back four silver marks. Aye, and we shall go hungry because of it. I'm not surprised when you pay back double what you borrow. Give him back two silver marks. Bless you, gentlemen. I'm grateful for this friend. It can make a lot of difference. Are you on the moneylenders list? Yes. What's your name? Hugh of the Wood. If this sounds too left-wing for the 1950s, when Senator Joe McCarthy was conducting his famous witch hunt for communist sympathizers, there is a reason. The television series was actually written by American writers living in England who were on McCarthy's blacklist. And they were not being paid very much, and they were probably grateful to get the work. But they did kind of code into these stories very seditious messages. The idea of Robin Hood living in a very communal, almost communist society. I mean, this would really have enraged McCarthy had he figured out what was going on. And this idea, too, of robbing from the rich to give to the poor. I mean, it's a very anti-capitalist message. The television Robin Hood came to Britain just 10 years after the end of World War II. The British were on the winning side, but at tremendous cost. And since the war, the empire they had owned became a commonwealth of which they were just a member. I think Robin Hood remains, in many ways, the central figure for British, um, English, patriotic fervor. That is, he is a, a kind of central figure of English patriotism out of English history. He's a Saxon, and he stands for Saxon freedoms and so on against the kind of French oppressions that the Normans have brought to England. The testimony of a Saxon serf means nothing. I have another witness, a Norman witness of high standing. Robin Hood has all of the qualities that the English valued, that the imperial world valued. He's noble, more innately noble than really noble. He's honest, he's hardworking, he's loyal, he has the ability to inspire loyalty in others, but he accepts true authority, royal authority, and he's against untrue authority. He's, he's against corruption. These were all of the virtues that was considered essential in an imperial servant. So you have this wonderful, perfect imperial hero who never leaves Sherwood Forest. Robin Hood's popularity hasn't diminished even in the 21st century. You can find his picture on an astonishing number of things. He's even in a commercial for the world's largest retailer. You'd think movie stars and audiences would get tired of Robin Hood, but they don't. Douglas Fairbanks played him in the 20s, followed by Earl Flynn in the 30s. And in the 90s, Kevin Costner became Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. There are literally hundreds of films and television shows about him, made in countries around the world. This one is from Finland. Today, after hundreds of years, the story continues. The hero from Servwood Forest is back. And there are video games where you can be Robin Hood. Next! Of course, these days it's hard to be considered a global presence if you're not on the internet. And Robin is there in a big way. There are literally hundreds of websites about him. It's a virtual Sherwood Forest. The World Wide Web has an international scope, which is interesting. And there's a sense of community, which is something that you see in the Robin Hood legend with the Merry Men. There's a sense of bonding and community. And you do get that in the web. Originally, it was going to be one page um, with just a quick summary of the legend, and then I found more to say, and then I thought, wouldn't it be nice to offer this feature to people? And uh, it snowballed from there. If Robin Hood is still popular today, one of the reasons is, unlike the Lone Ranger or Superman, there is the belief that he was an actual historical figure. Could this be true? Was there a real Robin Hood?
Almost 800 years after his story was first told, there is a growing group of Robin Hood devotees who are seriously asking the question, was there a real Robin Hood? I personally believe that there was a Robin Hood, but I don't know who he was, and I don't think, to be honest, anybody else really does. But there are some historians who feel not only sure that there was a real Robin Hood, they think they know who he was. I think, I honestly think, this is the closest anybody is ever going to get to an original Robin Hood. David Crook is an historian who works in the Public Record Office in London. He thinks that the original Robin, or Robert Hood, was really an actual outlaw named Robert of Weatherby. Crook found a connection between these two names in old records. It was historical pay dirt. The basis for considering that Robert Hood is the um, original Robin Hood is that he is a criminal. His goods are being confiscated in Yorkshire by a man who had previously been Sheriff of Nottingham, the Sheriff in the year for which this account is first held. Now, at the very same time, the same Sheriff of Yorkshire is commissioned by the King to take a posse, to get together a band of knight sergeants and to capture a, um, an outlaw, a man called Robert of Weatherby. The fact that Robert of, of Weatherby was chased by a, a posse, specially recruited and paid for by the Sheriff of Yorkshire with the royal money, suggests that he was a criminal beyond the ordinary. He's around at the same time as the Robert Hood who appears in the other set of entries. And my suspicion is that he may be the same person. What I think happened was that he was a, a minor local celebrity who managed to defy the might of the law, the King's Sheriff, for a short time before he was inevitably captured by these men and put to death. My own view about this is that it seems to be pretty clear that the name Robert Hood or Robin Hood had developed as a sort of nickname for a famous thief, a notorious outlaw. Perhaps without much benefit of a very developed legend. Uh, I once put it that, that, the, uh, that the name precedes the legend. And it's possibly out of that, out of this notorious character Robert of Weatherby, who may well be called Robert Hood at the time as a sort of nickname, that all the legends grow. Another theory about the origins of the Robin Hood stories is that they were based on the exploits of someone else entirely, an outlawed nobleman named Fulk Fitzwarren, whose actual life was surprisingly similar to the tales of Robin Hood, even including the fact that Fulk knew and disliked King John. There certainly are parallels between Fulk Fitzwarren and the sort of milieu out of which the Robin Hood stories come. Fulk and John were actually brought up together in Henry II's household. That's Henry II, John's father. There's a wonderful story of how they were playing chess together on one day, and John got very, very cross and kicked the chessboard over, all over the room. And Fulk then gave, punched him like that, John's jaw, and John, in a pathetic way, went off and moaned to his father, Henry II. Henry II was made a sterner stuff and said, you jolly well deserved it. Fulk was right. Go away and get yourself whipped. Some historians think that Robin Hood tales go even further back than Fulk Fitzwarren. Back to the construction of Hadrian's Wall in Northern England, almost 2,000 years ago. The Romans employed mercenaries here in Britain. They came from Germany and they brought their own gods with them too. And for instance on Hadrian's Wall there used to be an altar there to one of their deities. And you look at it and the first thing that springs to mind is it's Robin Hood, he's standing there in a forest outfit, in a forest, with a boy in one hand and arrows in the other. That dates back to about the second century. I think the reality of the Robin Hood tradition is the myth, the stories, the fact that people are still making television, film, songs about it. It's a massive cultural myth. The only English cultural myth that's lasted from the Middle Ages to the present and shows every sign of going on. You know, the feminist Robin Hood is developing now. That's its reality. Instead of looking for a medieval character, it's, I think, personally more important to stick with the themes of the story and disguise, revenge, 
betrayal, good guys overcoming bad guys, goes back an awful long way beyond the medieval era. It would be very nice to think that Robin Hood was a real person, perhaps a real 13th century outlaw. But for me, I think he'll always remain a childhood hero. Do we really want to find the real Robin Hood? I'm not sure that I personally do. Whether Robin Hood was real or not, these days, new Robin Hoods are springing up all over the place. One of the reasons Robin Hood has survived for so long is that he's been the model for countless others. The details of their struggles may be different, but they also have much in common. Robin Hood is the best-known outlaw hero, but there are dozens of outlaw heroes, not just in England, several in England. Harewood the Wake, for example, very famous in his time, almost unknown now. Uh, there are a number of outlaw heroes in Mexico, Pancho Villa, Zapata. Um, there are a number of outlaw heroes, for example, in Europe, uh, Robert Le Diable in France, uh, William Tell in Switzerland, any country will, will have them. They all have many of the same stories attached to them, how they are cornered by authority and how their wits and their bravery get them out of this. They aren't heroes who break out by force of arms. They break out really by cleverness or by the fact that one of their companions will come and spring them. So in that sense, you get these outlaw heroes who, who are on the edge of things, but who are really known for their wits. That's what we value in them, their ability to think. There are a number of modern instances of outlaw heroes that are frequently cited. I think that uh, Che Guevara would be the most obvious one. Somebody who goes against the status quo in the notion that the status quo can be changed for the better, and whose opposition to it, therefore, is principled. He starts out in Cuba, but he then appears in various countries in Latin America, and now on posters in many people's bedrooms and so on. So his status as outlaw seems to me no longer to have to do with political change, but to have to do with the kind of romance of opposition, perhaps of anarchy, um, but uh, also of idealism. Robin Hood has stood the test of time, almost eight centuries now. But does the man with the bow have a future? The modern day appeal of Robin Hood is exactly what it was in the old days. The spirit of adventure, freedom, a man striving for justice for the common people are something we can really identify with today. It's one of the reasons why he'll never lose his popularity. He'll change to suit our generation and succeeding generations, but the original theme will stay the same. I think there's a bit of Robin Hood in us all. We'd like to break away from the system. We'd like to live in the Greenwood. We'd like to right wrongs that we see being committed by those who are in a position over us. I am the 930th Sheriff of Nottingham. I feel great sense of history and uh, I take great pride in, in the position, but uh, I see myself more of so Robin Hood rather than Sheriff of Nottingham. I'm always fighting for the rights of uh, people, especially disabled, elderly and poor people. So you could say I'm doing uh, the job Robin Hood did in his time. People have always been recreating the myth of Robin Hood. If they didn't, it would die. You know, they don't, they've stopped doing the myth of Gilgamesh in our civilization, so no one knows who Gilgamesh is. But a few thousand years ago, everybody in the world would have known Gilgamesh. He'd have been the Robin Hood of the time. Once we stop recreating Robin Hood, <coughs> the stories of Robin Hood will continue to be told because they're deeply human and satisfy desires that exist virtually everywhere and throughout human history. Whether it's in the 13th century medieval world of King John, the 19th century society of Queen Victoria, or in the digitized information age of the 21st century, 
There are corrupt, abusive officials like the Sheriff of Nottingham. And because of that, people will always feel the need for outside help, even from someone outside the law, an outlaw hero who out of the love for justice comes and saves us from our cruel enemies. And that hero, no matter what his name, is Robin Hood. <laughs>